Good morning. It is a grand morning. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to come and to worship together. And today we are, uh, we've been walking through the book of John for three years. It was uh, three years ago today, I think it is, uh, that I preached the first message out of uh, the book of John. And during COVID, when it first started, we took a little break for a while and uh, dealt with some things pertinent to COVID. And now then we are back in the book of John and we are preaching the last message. A lot of things have changed since we started this uh, series of messages. Uh, but there's one thing that never changes. Uh, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. And so I'm grateful that before COVID, God's word applied, during COVID it applied, and in this aftermath of COVID, we still can depend upon God. We're in the book of John, chapter 21, and let me kind of set the scene where we were last week. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of places in uh, the Holy Land where we know sort of around the vicinity of where something happened, but maybe not the ex exact place. Uh, I'll give you an example. The field where David killed Goliath. We know exactly where that was because of the description of mountains and the, and the region. And we believe that we know exactly where Jesus met the disciples there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee um, as they were coming in. And we know that this is the third time that Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection. Not all the disciples were there every time, but where Jesus makes an appearance. And whenever Jesus calls out to them as they're coming in, they've been fishing all night, and Jesus says to them, have you caught anything? And they just simply answer no. My suggestion to them would be they need to carry Henry with them because he is a fisherman. Did y'all see the picture of that fish he caught? I mean, it was huge. It was bigger than Henry. But uh, these disciples, professional fishermen, they caught nothing. And so Jesus tells them, cast your nets on the other side. And there's so many of Henry's fish in there, 153, I believe it is, that they can't hardly pull it in. And John leans over to Peter and said, Peter, it's the Lord. And no boat could go fast enough for, for Peter. He picked up his coat and he tied it on and he dove like Forrest Gump into the, into the water and he swam to, to shore. Now there was a conversation or there was a period of time for a conversation between the time that Peter swam ashore about 100 yards and when the others got there in the boat. We don't know that what was said. Honestly, I don't know that anything was said. Peter's mind goes back to the failure on the night before Jesus was crucified. He thinks about what he did in denying Jesus. So the conversation that we're going to read this morning is perhaps one of the most important conversations Peter ever has. If you will look there in John chapter 21 in verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Barjona, Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, or Jonah, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, this he said, signifying by what kind of death that Simon Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them and the one that had leaned back on the bosom at the, upper, at the uh, supper in the upper room and said, Lord, uh, 
Who is the one who betrays you? So Simon Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? That, that man is John, of course. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come. What is that to you? The reason this conversation is so important is because this is Jesus restoring Simon Peter to usefulness. I don't know about everybody, but I... I believe we all deal with this. There's things in our lives and times in our lives where we know we're not doing the right thing. We're not following God. I, I, in my own testimony, throughout high school, I had, I had some great mentors. Uh, my pastors, uh, Larry Kennedy and Jim Futrell, took a special interest in me and were, were very generous with their time uh, with me, Rich Malone, probably as much, if not more than anyone, discipled me and mentored me. We, we didn't know what mentoring was back then. We didn't use that word. He just, uh, he, he just loved me. And he sat down with me every week, and we, we talked through things and read the Bible together, and he helped me to grow. And I was interested in sowing, and I... I Witnessed to everybody I played ball with. I, I witnessed to my friends. And my friends, many of my friends were church folks, so we fellowshiped together. But I went off to Mississippi College, and at no fault of Mississippi College, but I strayed. I didn't do a lot of things in the world, but I had my mind on lifting weights and working out and running and playing ping pong. <laughs> and girls. That's what was on my mind. And I didn't do a whole lot of things that the world says to do, but I didn't do what the Lord told me to do. And I strayed from him. And there was a period of time I had always gone to church. There was a period of time when I didn't want to go to church. And in that time that I, that I felt so far away, I had already surrendered to preach, and I grew so convicted that I left Mississippi College and I took a semester and I welded at Atlas Truck Bodies over in, in uh, Wren, Mississippi. And I truly felt like God could not possibly use me. I had been called to ministry. I had been in love with the Lord and I had left my first love and I had failed him. And as I lay on my face before God and, and repented and apologized, and I said, Lord, I know I'm, I'm not worthy. I know I, I can't be used anymore. But Lord, wherever you have me, Lord, give me the, give me the words. And I, I, I was with nine of the most foul, vulgar mouth men on the planet Earth. And I had an opportunity to witness to them one-on-one -on -one through the next weeks. And some of those were very, very hard. And some of those didn't even realize, you know, that they, how, how they talked. Uh, one man sitting at the lunch table just used God's name in vain every other sentence. And finally, I, I called to his attention and I said, uh, you know, I'd be, I, well, what I said to him then, my theology has uh, grown a little bit, but I said, if I, if I sit here and talk like you did, I'd be scared to death to walk out in a thunderstorm. And uh, he didn't even realize. Uh, and the next day, he kind of felt bad. He brought me a box, I mean a box of candy bars. Uh, um, I guess his peace offering to me or something like that. I took them and I ate every one of them. But, uh, <laughs> but about that time when I was having my quiet time and I was spending time with God and I was growing in the word and, and he put a new thirst for the water of life that flowed within me and, and I was sharing with people around me. The phone rang and it was Lowell Johnson from First Baptist Church in Vardaman and he said, we're looking for a summer youth director. This was in the end of February and so I went over and talked to him and, and I went, it's supposed to be the summer. So summer lasted from March until December. <laughs> uh, it was a long summer that year. I just, uh, 
had, had a great time, and it was a time that God restored me. I went to Blue Mountain College, and that was the best thing that ever happened in my, in my ministerial life. The, the best professor I've ever sat under was Dr. Travis at Blue Mountain. And then God had an ordained purpose also for me to go to Blue Mountain. I met Leanne, and, uh, and we got married. And God has blessed me. I, I still, every day, still feel like I am unworthy. But God, and by his grace, it's not, what, it's what we just sang. It's not me, it's Christ in me. Anything that good comes from my life, it is because of Christ. If you can say anything good about me, it is only because of Christ. I am unworthy, and I'm not worthy to be a shepherd either. But Jesus restored Peter, and Peter restored me. There are believers in this room, you have the same testimony. A little different details, maybe times and place. But times when you drifted from God and God would only let you go so far because he loves you. Simon Peter, and the truth that comes with this, is that he was restored. Now, Leanne watches a lot of shows on this uh, particular channel. It's called the Men Hater Channel on TV. And I am not interested in most of them. But she has watched some, uh, and, uh, and she has drawn me in. Um, oh, what's his name? Chip and Gloria Gaines, isn't that, isn't that their name? Out in Waco, Texas, the fixer-upper. Uh, they'll take, they call it the worst house in the best neighborhood. They'll take an old house, and they'll renovate it. And I've been interested in that. But let me tell you, that's not nearly as charming as it sounds, and it doesn't happen in a 30-minute program. It takes a long time. So, uh, but I, I have met the original Fixer Upper, and he doesn't deal just, he, he deals with people. And that is exactly what happens. So I want us to look at the truth as Peter is, as he is restored to usefulness, some truths that apply for him and for us. The first one is that loving Jesus is the key to knowing Jesus. You say you want to know more about Jesus and you want to know Jesus. The way that you get to know Jesus is that you fall in love with Jesus, that you love him. This takes them back to the night at, before the crucifixion and Jesus has told them this is what's going to happen. They're going to come and take me and I'll be killed and I'll rise again. And Peter said, Jesus, shut your mouth. And that's just about as disrespectful as he said it too. Jesus... That's not going to happen. You know why? Because I'm here. Now, I don't know about these other yahoos. John, so sentimental, you know, he'll be over there crying. And we know about Thomas. I'll, you'll turn around, he just won't be there. But I'm here. That's not going to happen. And Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows, you're going to have denied me three times, even knowing me. What happened? They came and arrested Jesus and Peter kind of reacted and pulled out his sword, tried to cut a fellow's head off and then cut his ear off and Jesus said, put your sword up. I don't need that. If, if I wanted that, I could call my heavenly father and that'd be, that'd be thousands of angels down here, 12 legions of angels down here. And uh, put your sword up. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. Put your sword up. And after that, Simon Peter kind of backed into the shadows and they all disappeared. They all ran away. And that night, as Peter kind of followed from a distance and watched the trial of Jesus three different times, they said, hey, I recognize your, your accent. You're, you're from Galilee. You, you were one of the disciples. No, I don't know what you're talking about. And a little girl by the fire said, yeah, I know you. You're one of his disciples. Three times and Peter denied knowing Jesus. And the Bible does record for us that as they marched him out, that Jesus' eyes met Peter and gazed at him, and Peter could do nothing but go out and cry. Peter knew that he had failed. Now Peter swims ashore, and I think as he gets there, it's just an awkward silence. He doesn't know what to say. And so all the disciples come, and after they've eaten, and and uh, Peter looks at Jesus and Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? Now I know I've, uh, I've taught this several times, but if you'll indulge me, I want to go through it again. We, we have one word for love. 
and we talk about love in, in, I love ice cream, I love my wife, I love my mother, I love dogs or whatever, you know, people talk about love. But we don't mean the same thing, do we? I hope you don't. I hope you don't love your wife less, I hope you don't love ice cream more than you love your husband. Uh, it may be a close call, but I hope you love your husband more. In the Greek, in the Koine Greek, they have four words. And we would translate each of them as love, but we kind of understand the meaning of them. There, there is first agape love. And whenever you speak of agape love, that is a godly love. That is a selfless love. That is the love that the Holy Spirit provides and gifts us with. It is the enduring quality of the gift of God. It's the way God loves us. The second is a filial love. It is a friendship love. But it is a love that really kind of is mutual. It depends on somebody loving you to love them back. And that can be very deep, that friendship love. Uh, a brother can love uh, and, and stick together closer than sometimes even family. And then there is the family love. The storge is the Greek word. And in that, it is that uh, family love. Like you love your mother and you love your daddy and you love your, you love your papa. Everybody ought to love papa. Don't you think everybody should love Papa? It's just that kind of love that you have for your family. And then last is the eros. That is the romantic type of love. The Bible does not teach about how to eros. But what happens here is that Jesus looks, and this is a play on words. So listen to the words. Jesus says, Simon Peter, do you agapio me? Do you love me with that selfless love? Because, see, that's what Peter said when he was back in the garden. I, I'm, I love you more than any of these, and I love you like nobody can, and, and I'm selfless in my love. Nothing's going to happen to you because I love you in that way. And Peter comes to the reality. Lord, I filio you. Lord, you know all things. You know my heart. You know I do love you, but I realize my love is dependent on you loving me first. My love is dependent on how I walk with you. I feel you. Owe you. And Jesus said, Tend to my lambs. Peter, son of John, do you? Agape owe me? Yes, Lord, I love you, but I feel you owe you. And then the third time. Peter, do you feel you owe me? And it grieved Peter. Lord, you know my heart. I cannot on my own love you with an agape love, but Lord, I do feel you, you, and my love depends upon you, and your love is everlasting. Lord, I do love you. The lesson for us to learn is that it starts with Jesus. He loved you so much that he died on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I do love God, but I've realized since I was 19 and he pulled that, that rug of arrogance out and I realized that I was a failure on my own, that I realized that he loved me anyway and I've loved him back ever since. I've failed him many times, but now I love him with a reality that there is not anything that I could do deserve, to deserve his love. But there is not anything that I could do that would separate me from his love. Praise God. I am thankful today as you think about this, knowing Jesus is to love Jesus. And it goes on to us that it is within us that that moves us to something. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8 says, and, and though you have not seen him, has anybody here seen Jesus? We, we've seen 
portrayals of Jesus. We've watched some things. We've seen pictures and sculptures. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I don't have to see him. I know what he's done for me. And by faith, I believe. And that leads me to love him. It's interesting. Look back in, in John 21, verse 15. Um, Jesus, after breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, what does that mean? What's he talking about? Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? There's some scholars that believe that Jesus pointed back over to the boat and the nets and the fish because you see Peter, when he was uh, with the disciples and he felt like he had failed so and, and had, they were still afraid, even though he had heard Jesus, uh, you know, he had reappeared, but he just felt so discouraged and he said, I go fishing. You know what Peter was saying? I'm going back to my old life. I am so depressed and I have ruined it all and I'm going back to my old life. So maybe Jesus was pointing to the boat and the fish and the nets and saying, do you love me more than these? Or maybe he was referring back to that night when, when Simon Peter said, Lord, I don't know about all these others, but that's not going to happen. You're not going to be taken. You're not going to be killed because I'm here. Peter, do you love me more than you love these? I'm not quite sure. The Bible just lends itself to no details here. Was Jesus pointing? Who was he pointing to? What was he pointing to? But really, it doesn't matter. Jesus says, do you love me more than... And that's the question to my heart. And it doesn't matter where I point. Do I love Jesus more than anybody and do I love Jesus more than anything? I've told my wife, and my wife knows that I love her. But Leanne knows that I cannot love her like I should unless I love Jesus as my first love. And when I love Jesus as my first love, then I can be the husband that I ought to be. If I love Jesus as my first love, then I can love my children and grandchildren like I should because I can love them with what kind of love? Agape. It, it is my relationship with Jesus that allows me to love others. So when Jesus asks, okay, you got to pick, he, he's not being, he's, he's just being God. He's being sovereign. And he's bringing Simon Peter along to that point to say, do you recognize, you say that you love me dependent upon me, but do you recognize how you can love the very best that you can? Loving Jesus is the key to knowing him. And you can't put any price tag. Matthew 18, there's a, there's a parable that's told and there's a merchant who is, he deals in pearls. And he finds a pearl is perfect. I mean, it is perfect. And he goes and he liquidates all of his assets, everything that he has, to buy the pearl of great price. I own the pearl of great price in my life. Or actually, really, the pearl of great price owns me. There is nothing that anyone could ever offer that compares. We've been singing about that this morning. Indescribable. Jesus is that one. Loving Jesus is key to knowing him. And then serving Jesus is a result of loving Jesus. Uh, every time, I'll not go back and read them, but every time that Simon Peter answers, what does, how does Jesus reply? Simon Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. And what does Jesus say? Tend my lambs. Do you love me? You know I love you. Shepherd my flock. Do you love me? You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. 
Whenever Simon Peter stood that night and Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some of them say maybe John the Baptist come back or maybe Elijah. And Jesus said, whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter gives that great confession and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you, upon this, upon what? Upon Peter? No, some say that. But upon this profession of faith, upon this understanding and faith, upon this, I will build what? My church. Not Peter's church. I know we talk about that Going back, what, what's happening at your church? Let me tell you about what's happening in my church. I'm going to my church. It's not my church. It's his church. It's his sheep. It's his flock. But he gives us the understanding that when we love him, what results is serving others. You make that connection in your mind. If you love Jesus, you cannot help but have the call and be fulfilled in serving others. You cannot just sit in a building and sing about how we love Jesus and preach about how we love Jesus and not serve others. And Jesus tells us to lay down our life. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name. How? In having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. God sees whenever we minister to others, that's how we express and manifest our love for him. That's how it's done. It may be simply mowing your neighbor's yard. It may be just taking somebody a dozen eggs. It may be bringing somebody a meal. It may be just sending out a note or a card. It's ministering to others. And sometimes it's not even, you don't even know what to do. I have stood so many times at a graveside or in a funeral home or in somebody's home or a hospital room and I simply don't have the words to say. And y'all know I'm not a big hugger. I'm developing into a hugger. You know, I got plenty to hug. So sometimes that's all you can do is just simply say, I don't have the words. I, I don't, but I love you. And sometimes it's just that simple service. And that is how God sees. God says, see that? <laughs> That's, he's loving me. She's loving me. I do believe that for us, the greatest command is to love the Lord our God with everything within us. The second one is to love others. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But we live in a selfie generation. Everybody know what a selfie is? 25 years ago, if you went to uh, the Grand Canyon, you'd take a picture of the Grand Canyon. Now everybody goes and they take a picture of themselves with the Grand Canyon behind them. USA Today reports that the millennial generation will take 25,000 selfies in their lifetime. That you've got to be in the center of the screen. Well, our service to Christ is a I don't even know the words, a selfless, a, a selfiest, less love. We don't have to be in the center of the frame. We want Jesus in the center of the frame. I gave a man some things this past week. He comes by quite often and uh, has very particular taste. And uh, so he comes by and he offer, he asked for a vein of sausage and uh and crackers. That's what he asked for. So in between times of his visit, then some of us will run by and pick up buying a sausage and crackers. And you may say, well, does he get government help? Yes, he gets government help. But he has a need. So I ask him, what, what do you need? How can I help you? And he's a kind gentleman. He always is very complimentary about our building and, 
and about the staff and I asked, what do you need? And he said, oh, just some Vienna sausage and crackers. I've never thought about giving Vienna sausage and crackers as an expression of love for Jesus. But I did this week because, you know, preparing for the message and thinking about what we do love in Jesus. And I laid Vienna sausage and crackers on the altar to Jesus. I've talked to him before. He's a, he's a believer. And so I told him, I give these to you in the name of Jesus. He said, thank you, and went on about his way. It, it doesn't have to be a lot. It just has to be everything we do. It ought to be about Jesus. Loving Jesus comes through in our service. Let me end finally and look in verses 18 and 19. Following Jesus gives you hope for the future. This, this may seem odd to you, but it's not. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself, walk wherever you wished. Simon Peter was one of those kind of guys. He'd go in any place he wanted to go. He was a tough guy. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Then verse 19 helps you understand. It's not just talking about getting old and not able to do for yourself. He says, now this he said signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. The Bible does not tell us how Simon Peter died. But Origen wrote it down and then Eusebius, a church historian, writes it down a little later. Simon Peter died by crucifixion. And yet he still did not feel worthy to die in the same manner that Jesus died. So he requested and asked to be crucified upside down. Even though Jesus restored him, he, he knew what it would mean for him eventually one day. And he loved Jesus so much and wanted to honor Jesus so much. He wanted to honor him even in his death. Everybody asks, what in the world is going on? Why is he upside down? And even the guards and the praetorian and the officials all had to say, well, this is why he didn't want to die in the same way Jesus did because he didn't feel worthy. So even in his death, he glorified God. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. He knew us before we were ever conceived. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Before I was ever conceived, my days were numbered. 2003, the U.S. had uh, taken over Iraq and Saddam Hussein was on the run, hiding in a hole, and they found him. Donald Rumsfeld was the uh, Secretary of Defense at that time, and he's a man of faith. Um, one of the reporters worded it, so you would say, as we, they had not yet caught Saddam Hussein, but a reporter said, so you would say Saddam Hussein's days are numbered. And Donald Rumsfeld paused and said, well, I guess you could say that about all of us. For all of us, our days are numbered. And that's true for every one of us. Our days are numbered. And I don't know when that is, nor do you, but God does. But this one thing I do know, that whenever that day comes for me, it won't catch God by surprise, but it's going to be... A glorious time because 2 Corinthians tells me to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. I get to serve him. I get to serve others. But for me to die is gain. That's something else we sang about this morning. There's nothing, even death itself, that can take away my hope in Jesus. Whenever that day comes, there, there were a few folks who thought that 
was a couple years ago for me. Death has no sting. If that had been the case, then I know exactly where I would be. And if I walk out of here and die today, I know exactly where I'm going to be. And you can say, well, his days were numbered. God knew exactly when, and God took him home. And you don't have to mourn for me. You can mourn for my family, and please do comfort them. I mean, now, wait a minute. I'm not making any plans. Get that straight. But when that does happen, you can simply say, well, he's having the best time he's ever had before. You know what? Your days are numbered, too. Are you ready?